Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, The Diabetic Foot, Reviewing the Medical Record. During today's program, the presenter will cover the following. The soap note, being subjective, patients, complaints, and history, objective, physical exam, assessment, differential diagnosis, and opinion, and plan, treatment, recommendation, discussion, and return. The presenter will also cover certain diabetic facts. The presenter for today's program is Dr. Philip Obachensky. Dr. Obachensky is a podiatrist, board certified in foot and ankle surgery by the American Board of Podiatric Surgery. He has 34 years of experience treating diabetic foot wounds, 30 of those years in solo private practice. The expert graduated from the New York College of Podiatric Medicine, where two years of clinic work were required. Dr. Boschensky then stayed on for a two-year residency, rotating through 13 different locations throughout New York City. Since 1988, he has been involved with podiatric case review and has given opinions on behalf of patients and doctors. Some doctors have been orthopedists. Dr. Obachensky has worked with Workers' Compensation Board, a Deputy Attorney General, and a State Licensing Board. We will take two question and answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your questions to the presenter. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email that will include a link to the archived recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint presentation used during today's program. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's webinar is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. We're going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest, Dr. Philip Obosensky. Dr. Obosensky, the program is all yours. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. And thanks to Pass as well for having me. And thanks to all the participants. I hope uh, you enjoy it and find it uh, informative. And I uh, look forward to your questions. As you uh, see the title uh, of the webinar, Diabetic Foot, Reviewing the Medical Record, I uh, feel this would be a uh, general medical record in any uh, podiatrist's office. Uh, everything that we're talking about today does not have to be found in every single note every time the patient comes to the office, uh, but the whole uh, cumulative chart should be looked at, and uh, I feel this is a very practical approach that uh, every podiatrist uh, nationally should be doing and uh, should be acceptable. Um, in case you don't know that the terminology, the SOAP note, that should be the standard uh, note that most of the doctors would follow, and the S would stand for subjective, and this would review the past the medical surgical history of the patient, uh, their medications, allergies, and family and social history. The patient would usually fill out that form. Uh, the uh, social history would uh, include the smoking history, and that is uh, pertinent to the uh, diabetic foot, uh, the healing capacity in the blood flow. And there's also a, a part called the review of systems, the ROS, uh, which includes, uh, as you see, the height, weight, blood pressure. Uh, the staff, uh, the doctor staff can take this information with the patient, and the doctor can review it. Uh, usually it's important at some point uh, to monitor the glucose, uh, asking the patient when they went to their family doctor last for their uh, glucose, uh, ask them what their glucose is, documented in the chart if it's uncontrolled as a non-compliant diabetic patient, uh, ask them if they have a fever, if they are having an overwhelming infection, sepsis, their response to infection, uh, ask them about their nutrition, weight loss, uh, if they are very, very frail and thin, if they're on the supplements, the vitamins, how their diet is, as well, that will affect the uh, healing potential as well. Uh, to later on decide if you have to speak to the family doctor or consult with a nutritionist uh, to work on uh, appetites and the metabolism to affect your healing. Uh, ask the patient in the beginning uh, about their sensations in their feet. Uh, that can tell you if uh, you have to look for signs of the diabetic neuropathy, uh, if they don't feel pain, if they have numbness, tingling, burning in their feet, if it's the one foot, both feet, uh, you have to rule out if it's coming from the back from a, a disc problem, radiculopathy, or is it uh, coming from the foot if it's one foot or both feet, as it should be a bilateral with a diabetic uh, problem. And then getting into the typical uh, 
a part of the subjective aspect, the history of the chief complaint, which is the duration, uh, the reason, any reason for the problem, whether or not it's a recurrent problem, any history of trauma. Is this a workman's compensation case that they get hurt on the uh, street, in their home, in their friends, at a store? Uh, and then the history of the treatment. Were they uh, doing anything for themselves? And did they go to any other podiatrists? Did their family doctor do anything? Did they go to any other specialists for uh, treatment? And then the objective of part of the note, the O, uh, usually one of the first things we check is the circulation, feeling the pulses in both feet, the DP and the PT, which is dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial, and just by a palpation uh, with the hands. If there's any uh, question, uh, if it's a, a borderline, uh, usually it's uh, graded on a scale of 0 to 4. The average, the normal would be a 2, plus 2 out of 4. Uh, 3, it was very, very strong, and 4, you would see the pulse actually beating right out of the skin. That's how strong it would be. And then 0, you just can't uh, feel it. That could be from a swelling, uh, abnormal placement of the artery. Just It's an anatomical variant as well. If there's any uh, possible uh, poor circulation, peripheral vascular disease, then we usually send the patients for an arterial Doppler. It can be done uh, privately. Uh, or a hospital, uh, or through a vascular surgeon. If the doctor wanted to send them to a vascular surgeon first to decide if the Doppler should be done, that could be done as well. And the main, uh, quite the main, uh, uh, finding is the ABI, which is the ankle brachial index. They measure the blood pressure in the arm and at the ankle and get a number. If it's uh, one, that'd be great. Uh, lower than that is a borderline. But sometimes this is abnormally high as well as I have uh, having calcification of the Inside of the arteries, uh, medial calcification would be called, and if they're very hard arteries and they can't compress it, they have to put a blood pressure cuff on the extremity to do the measurements, and they can't compress it, so you get an artificially high number. You can't always trust the number, and usually the vascular surgeon who's re reading the report and commenting would say that as well, that they feel it can be an abnormally high number. And uh, there's a thing called the pulse volume recording, which could be done to try and determine the circulation uh, if that number is very high, artificially high. One of the other things in the objective of the portion, which is the uh, portion that the doctor sees and feels and uh, has observation, would be describing the ulcer of a uh, diabetic foot patient. And lots of these are rules and regulations are coming from uh, Medicare, and the other insurance companies are following suit as well. So they would like the length and the width of described or the circumference and the depth in centimeters and millimeters, uh, inches, if necessary. Uh, describing the base of the ulcer, uh, what it looks like, and the surrounding tissue. Uh, is it the callus around it? Is it red? Is it inflamed? Uh, is it swollen? Is it uh, black? Uh, is there any exposed joint, tendon, or bone in the ulcer? Uh, if that's the case, then it's quite deep. It's through the subcutaneous tissue, it's through the fat, and you're seeing joint tissue and uh, tendon would be above the joint uh, tissue was in, in that area. And if it's uh, seeing bone, you're through the joint capsule already as well, and obviously very deep. And you know, comment on any pus in the uh, wound, any advancing cellulitis redness, uh, is there any granulation tissue in the wound, which would mean the red BC tissue that bleeds very easily when it's touched, that would be granulation tissue showing, showing signs of healing. Uh, sometimes it's whitish, yellowish, uh, fibrosis, uh, fibrotic type of uh, material, also known as the bio burden, uh, another uh, term for the uh, film on the top, biofilm on the top of the uh, wound. And we would get back to the uh, neuropathy to document what the patient said in the subjective part, uh, document their neuropathy or lack of neuropathy, either with the old fashioned the tuning fork uh, or uh, Light touch means a little uh, wispy filament, uh, broom type of a thing. Uh, that's one thing. Or pin is another aspect. And then the newest is the called a monofilament, which is uh, measuring grains, and that's the zero, uh, uh, 0 0.570 uh, uh, grains. And it's uh, just a thin piece of plastic that has become the national international standard of uh, sensation. If they you touch the leg and then touch the foot and toes and see if the patient can uh, feel that. The uh, 
description of the foot is very helpful. Is it uh, extremely flat, collapsed, uh, totally hitting the ground, no arch? Uh, is the foot the straight, uh, which would be rectus? There's a term called collapsing. There's a plain valgus, which is the total collapse of the foot. Uh, rectus means a perfectly straight, normal foot. Uh, you want to go on and describe the uh, toenails, if they're totally normal toenails or if they fungus, the thick, abnormal toenails, any uh, infections, uh, any ingrown toenails. Uh, skin color is uh, described if it's uh, brawny, thick, uh, brownish color. That can be from a venous asthesis, which doesn't have to be due to any diabetic problem, uh, but the uh, also uh, reddish uh, rubor is one term, R-U-B-O-R, uh, where the uh, skin is a darker reddish color uh, from a bad circulation. Uh, feeling the texture of the skin, if it's dry, if it's clammy, uh, cool, uh, sweaty. Uh, also, uh, that would be controlled by the diabetic neuropathy. Hair growth, uh, usually the hair growth is the first thing that goes with bad circulation, so that's why that's uh, noted as well. Uh, temperature is uh, noted uh, in just in general uh, between the two feet or sometimes uh, exact uh, measurements in uh, degrees with uh, thermometers. Uh, lesions are also noted, uh, keratotic meaning uh, callus, uh, lesions, corns, calluses on the toes, between the toes, on the bottom of the foot. Uh, some of these can be uh, filled with blood, uh, which is a typical with a diabetic uh, foot, and they would, uh, that would be noted as a discoloration or old blood. It would be noted to say old blood in the callus. It can be below the uh, callus when the callus is divided, and that can be noted. That's a common a problem, common finding with the diabetic patients. They have what's called capillary fragility, so they get the bleeding into the uh, callus, and this can be a precursor to a uh, ulcer. The ulcer can be below this uh, callus, and once it's divided, that's a sound. Another uh, hot button issue is uh, pigmented lesions uh, to make sure that the person doesn't have any skin cancer and melanomas. So they are documented that you've looked for them, and uh, the doctor should look for them and uh, describe them. Again, color and size, and state if they're stable, if they're new, if they're changing. Size, shape, color, then a biopsy would uh, be needed to make sure there's no malignancy, squamous cell, basal cell, or malignant melanoma. Then comes the A uh, assessment, which is the diagnosis, or you could say clinical impression. Uh, obviously, can be a diabetic foot. It could be diabetic neuropathy. It also could be any of the specific uh, pedal diagnoses from the toenails and the foot and ulcers, etc., with a secondary diagnosis of the diabetic code or a diabetic neuropathy code. There's probably about 25 different diabetic codes that can be used based on uh, diabetes, uh, poor circulation control, uncontrolled, and insulin or non-insulin and those that can be put into the diagnosis area as well. But uh, the differential diagnosis uh, should also be uh, included and uh, discussed. Uh, sometimes it's nothing to do with the diabetes, but it can be the CRIPS uh, 1 or 2, the old term, the RSD, reflexive sympathetic dystrophy, or the uh, new term, the uh, chronic regional pain syndrome. Uh, Charcot foot is uh, commonly found with the diabetics as far as a uh, swollen, red-hot uh, foot, uh, not painful usually uh, because of the neuropathy, and uh, sometimes the doctor and the patient uh, think it's infected, uh, but it's an acute uh, emergency basically as far as the diabetic foot that they should not walk on that, but the bones can uh, shift, crack, fracture, and disintegrate from uh, two different theories of uh, if there's a lot of blood coming into the area or if the nerves have lost uh, the control of the blood vessels or if it's due to trauma and the patient has to be immobilized in this acute stage. And the gout is a very common uh, problem in uh, lots of patients and, and diabetics as well, and it's, uh, it can mimic the uh, diabetic uh, foot uh, infection or the Charcot uh, foot as well, a very, very red, hot, and swollen area of the foot, typically the big toe, uh, but can be on any part of the foot, uh, toes or foot. Uh, and it would be a very common uh, to get it confused with a Charcot problem or an um, acute uh, infection, uh, cellulitis, and the doctor has to determine the course of treatment and whether or not the patient needs antibiotics for infection 
or uh, anti-inflammatories for gout, either oral or uh, injectable. The uh, plan would uh, include the treatment uh, of the problem for a diabetic uh, wound. That would be the uh, debridement, uh, debridement, as some uh, people would say. And usually you have to describe your instruments that are being used uh, in the office, uh, scalpels with uh, scalpel blades. Uh, lots of times they're called number 15 and number 10. Uh, curettes, tissue nippers, uh, rondure for bone, bone cutting forceps, uh, pickups, forceps, uh, thumb and finger, that would, might be one other term that is used. All these different instruments that are used that is uh, normally required uh, to be stated somewhere how you are dividing this uh, lesion. And then a big uh, part of the treatment is usually offloading if it's a diabetic uh, foot wound, to take the pressure off of that wound in uh, some manner. Uh, very old uh, methods of uh, padding uh, the foot with the removable uh, pads that can be stuck onto the skin if the skin is not uh, damaged, or onto the shoe, inner sole, uh, felt and foam. The uh, shoe can be modified, the inso inside of the uh, shoe, the outside of the shoe. Rocker bars you may have heard of from years ago on shoes on the external aspect of the sole. Uh, the insoles can have a cutouts. There are special ones now with removable plugs with Velcro. So those the plugs, like a honeycomb, are taken out of the insole to take the pressure off that uh, wound. A hot uh, topic as well as a total contact cast, the TCC. Uh, some of them are made by companies that are easy to put on. And then the... Uh, one that the doctor can make up himself, uh, her host, herself, uh, wrapping the foot up with the padding, uh, padding the whole foot, uh, lower leg, and then dressing the wound and putting a cast on, fiberglass or plaster with a boot, a walking boot, and leaving that on for anywhere from days to a week to uh, let the uh, wound heal and rest. Any offloading can be done also with the crutches or a walker, uh, a cane, or telling the patient to walk on their heel. A cam walker, a CAM, uh, can be used as well. That's uh, plastic with Velcro, removable. The patient uh, can uh, take a bath or shower, and it doesn't have to sleep with it, uh, but it immobilizes the foot, ankle, a lower leg. It has a uh, curve at the bottom so they can uh, walk on it easier. And so that's another type of a total contact a cast a type of a situation. Surgical shoes can be dispensed in the doctor's office or clinic or hospital. Uh, Velcro uh, straps, a big open front to accommodate the bandages. Uh, sometimes the insoles are put in there that we talked about before. The removable insoles with the plugs are put in the surgical shoe to take the pressure off as well. A plain, ordinary, a thick, uh, dry store dressing could be used as a method of uh, offloading as well. And there is a thing called a heel weight-bearing shoe. It means the big wedge uh, in the, on the heel and the whole front part of the foot is off the ground, uh, sometimes a little unstable for the patient, so you have to make sure the patient will fall and break a hip. We don't let that happen, but that uh, can be done, Velcro closure and the open front before the bandage. And uh, some notation should be uh, put in there as far as the type of addressing that is uh, being used. The uh, latest uh, philosophy is to keep the bandage uh, moist and the wound moist to promote the healing. Uh, many years ago, betadine was used, iodine solutions were used to kill bacteria, to dry up the wound, but now uh, the feeling is that that dries out the tissue, kills the cells that are trying to grow, as well as the peroxide. Uh, shouldn't be using the peroxide either, uh, unless it was uh, grossly infected with pus, and uh, any of the methods to keep the uh, wound uh, moist. So the wet to dry dressings would not uh, be doing that because as it states, it would be drying out eventually. Uh, and the idea with that is that when it is dry and the gauze is fixed to the wound, you are then pulling the uh, neuroprotic tissue right off of the ulcer to debride the wound. But now uh, we prefer the sharp debridement and uh, keeping the wound uh, moist. There are many, many different types of uh, wound dressings out there, and uh, I will get into a little bit of that later. The one thing to... 
uh, look at is how many times the patient has uh, come back uh, for treatment. A uh, rule of thumb being that the 50% uh, change in the wound after four weeks, if that's not uh, being seen and the patient is coming back week after week after week for months or a year, uh, it's not unheard of, then have to rethink the etiology of the wound. Is it a diabetic foot ulcer? Is it something else? Uh, what is the cause of this ulcer? And rethink your treatment plan. And uh, getting back to the pigmented lesions, uh, it doesn't have to be pigmented necessarily, but it can be a malignancy in the ulcer, or the ulcer itself could be a malignancy and not a diabetic foot ulcer at all. So uh, doing biopsies to rule out a uh, squamous cell carcinoma, for instance, uh, ulcerated uh, skin cancer, and it's not a, uh, a uh, diabetic foot ulcer at all. Uh, but it could be uh, that type of malignancy. And uh, the philosophy is also to determine where you're going to do the ulcer, if it's on the periphery, or some doctors have uh, recommended multiple uh, biopsies in multiple points of the wound as well. And uh, part of the plan is uh, your referrals for help if uh, the patient is not progressing. Uh, vascular doctors, as we spoke about before, uh, if the circulation is poor, borderline, and uh, not healing, uh, infectious disease doctors, uh, we're going to get to uh, taking cultures and whether or not you need to have an infectious disease doctor on board to uh, help uh, to decide what antibiotics are used uh, in the outpatient uh, setting, orally or sometimes infusion uh, in their office uh, daily or weekly. And endocrinology uh, physician to uh, regulate the diabetes if their diabetes is out of control Getting back to the first the statement, they're saying that their sugar is out of control, the glucose is out of control, and either speaking with the family doctor or patient and uh, uh, suggesting an endocrinology consultation if uh, the present uh, diabetic uh, treatment is not working to control their glucose to help with the healing. And the, uh, we should be asking, the doctor should be asking if the patient is uh, seeing their family doctor regularly to uh, check uh, these are the factors that we're talking about, nutrition and glucose, et cetera. And the podiatrist could order the lab work, uh, the fasting glucose, the hemoglobin A1C, long-term uh, glucose measurement, or the CBC checking on infection, white blood cell count, uh, ESR, which is the sedimentation rate, CRP, uh, both are just general uh, indicators of inflammation, uh, checking on that, uh, checking the systemic response to the infection. Uh, that can be ordered by the podiatrist as well or in conjunction with the family doctor. Uh, part of the plan is to decide uh, when the patient has to be admitted. Uh, if the fever, if the patient has a fever that is uh, getting worse, the patient is getting septic, uh, quite uh, ill, lethargic, uh, unresponsive, uh, incoherent type of a thing, if the sugar is totally uncontrolled and uh, can't be controlled, another reason to admit. Uh, the septic uh, shock situation, if you think that's going to happen. Ischemia, uh, meaning the bad circulation uh, to the foot, leg. Uh, it's an acute uh, situation uh, where you need to correct a, an acute arterial block that's causing this uh, lack of uh, blood flow. Or uh, is the patient being admitted for vascular surgery to, on an elective basis to uh, try and get better blood flow down to the foot to uh, create healing? And then if the patient exhibits a cellulitis uh, in the foot with or without a wound, uh, but some people say if the diameter or the distance from the wound is, uh, say, two centimeters, uh, then uh, the patient would be admitted, but that doesn't have to be a strict uh, criteria. Uh, and a hard and fast rule uh, is just as far as two centimeters. That depends on the extent of the cellulitis and how the patient is feeling as well. Uh, another reason to admit the patient would be the exposed bone we talked about, we spoke about before. If that's a scene in the wound, uh, pretty rare that that wound will heal over exposed bone. And the other statement is if you see the bone or if it probes to the bone, then uh, you have a, a definition of osteomyelitis, so bone infection. So you're going to have to remove that bone to get that uh, wound to heal. So that would be the reason to admit the patient. Uh, it's in the next uh, sentence uh, where it probes the bone and ruling out the osteomyelitis. Uh, one way to do that uh, besides the exam is the MRI. Uh, the bone scan is another method. 
Uh, there are three different types of the bone scans that you see there. Uh, the oldest, most familiar would be the uh, Technetium 99 uh, bone scan. And also the bone biopsy. That's another uh, possible uh, thing that can be done in the office as well, especially if the patient is neuropathic and doesn't feel anything and has expones, exposed bone in the uh, wound. Uh, just take a piece of the bone and send it out to the laboratory and see if there's any uh, bacteria uh, in the bone, uh, bone infection. It could be sent for culture and sensitivity or it could send to be sent to pathology, uh, either or both, and that uh, can tell us if there's uh, any osteomyelitis. Another part of the plan uh, is the doctor should document that uh, the patient has been educated on the proper uh, foot care uh, for a diabetic patient, uh, giving out handouts, for instance, or website information. I just received one in the mail a couple of weeks ago for diabetesfootulcer.com, uh, for instance, uh, diabetesfootulcer.com, uh, and uh, referring the patients to that if they're considered literate, liter obviously. And uh, for documentation that you are telling them the do's and don'ts of uh, proper foot care with the diabetes uh, and or with the diabetic neuropathy as far as uh, avoiding uh, heat, uh, heating pads, don't put their feet up against the radiator, don't soak their feet in uh, hot water, testing the water with their hand uh, first, uh, not applying any acids, uh, to their uh, feet as far as for a wart treatment, for instance, or for a corner callus, uh, not doing their own toenails, uh, not uh, scraping any corns or calluses themselves, advising uh, about uh, shoe gear, uh, sock uh, usage, different types of socks, elastic tops, etc. Um, the shoe might have to be an extra depth shoe, it's called, with more room in the front from the, uh, from the top to the bottom to uh, give more space for the uh, toes, for instance. Uh, advising regular podiatric uh, care and follow-up and not doing their own uh, foot care at home, uh, not putting any creams or lotions between the toes, for instance, uh, or if they have uh, severe dry skin on their feet to make sure they use a dry skin cream every day, an emollient, either uh, over the counter or prescription, uh, not necessarily using any razors and knives to cut off any callus on the heels, uh, looking uh, for uh, cracked uh, heels, the bleeding, and uh, pus, etc. Sometimes they don't feel anything and they wait to see if they have the blood in their sock and that's the only time they know they have a problem. And the patient should be uh, given an appointment, a uh, return appointment. There should be documentation of that uh, as well, that uh, there is some, uh, supposed to be a follow-up uh, involved or if the patient uh, refuses uh, such a follow-up, that will be documented as well. And uh, I think that about covers everything that I had uh, to say about the uh, SOAP aspect. Uh, one article that I just re did uh, read uh, recently, uh, as far as uh, culture and sensitivity, a new word is a quantitative uh, culture. Uh, quantitative, uh, meaning that the culture is sent to a laboratory that will uh, literally count the number of bacteria, and if it's above uh, 10 to the 5th, uh, 10 to the 6th the power, then that uh, means that there's an infection and not just a superficial uh, colonization uh, of the uh, wound. Uh, that has to be determined sometimes if it's just a superficially uh, contaminated versus a, a deep uh, infection. So we're going to get into that in this uh, section as far as the plan. Also, uh, utilizing antibiotic uh, in the treatment of the patient, uh, taking this culture and sensitivity, whether or not it should be, uh, the philosophy is it should be a deep uh, culture. The swab, uh, Q-tip type swab, uh, should not just be run over the uh, superficial aspect of the wound or the ulcer, which is what I was saying before as far as superficial, and uh, going deep uh, to into the wound and uh, taking the culture that way. The uh, drug that uh, is prescribed uh, for the problem uh, should be uh, checked to see if it is indicated for a uh, foot uh, wound or the organism that is uh, growing out of the culture. Uh, sometimes the doctor chooses the wrong antibiotic, wrong for the wrong organism, uh, or the wrong dosage, uh, the times of the day that it's given, or the number of milligrams. Uh, the, a very common uh, Becoming more and more common is MRSA, 
MRSA, methicillin resistant fast aureus, a bacteria, uh, would be community acquired in the, the private doctor's office or versus the hospital acquired uh, from the hospitalized the patient. But that would be necessitating a different antibiotic and possibly uh, more uh, influencing your choice to have an infectious disease doctor involved as well. Uh, for more complicated antibiotic uh, treatment and more uh, limited choices of your antibiotic because lots of times they can't be, you can't use an oral antibiotic uh, prescribed uh, from the office. You'd have to use an IV antibiotic. And the, the uh, infectious disease doctor could sometimes do this through their office uh, with an infusion uh, program and the patient wouldn't have to be hospitalized necessarily. In the plan, uh, we would look for evidence of a conservative treatment uh, before any surgical treatment uh, for, say, a diabetic uh, ulcer. Uh, did the doctor try to do any of the things we talked about that would be conservative uh, before uh, going in to surgically treat the uh, diabetic uh, ulcer? Uh, sometimes the patient will walk in and say they want it fixed uh, surgically, and that should be documented. And uh, some experts may say that I've uh, been in the case and the doctor said that the conservative treatment would have worked anyway, so it didn't make any difference. But I think it's uh, behooves the doctor to document uh, whether or not certain conservative treatment was done and uh, what was done in the past and what has worked and hasn't worked before the surgery is uh, contemplated. When we get into advanced uh, treatments uh, for the uh, diabetic uh, wound, the NTWT is the uh, vacuum, uh, negative pressure wound uh, therapy, uh, VAC, V-A-C. Uh, different companies have uh, made them, but uh, K-Medic is, uh, KCI is uh, one of the leaders, uh, and it can be done in the person's home. It's a, a sponge, basically, that goes over the wound, into the wound, hooked up to uh, tubing, and it's uh, literally a small uh, vacuum that can be worn on your belt or a small device that's on your night table and continuously removes the fluid from the wound, uh, fluid and hopefully contamination, bacteria, pus, etc., to promote the granulation. And it can work very, very well. And nurses that can come to the patient's home to teach them how to put it on and how often to change it, for instance. Hyperbaric oxygen would not be in a home. Uh, they do have some extremity uh, chambers, but uh, those, I feel, have been proven not to be any value. The patient has to go into the whole body a chamber, usually at a hospital situation. Uh, they call a dive, uh, D-I-V-E, uh, like an ocean dive, and uh, their whole body is in the chamber and the oxygen is uh, administered systemically, and that can be used for the uh, treatment of uh, diabetic uh, wounds, infections, ulcers, uh, cellulitis, uh, gangrene, uh, necrotizing fasciitis, things like that that can happen emergencies, uh, acute surgical emergencies in the foot as well. Uh, platelet gel uh, means the PRP uh, blood is taken from the patient's arm and spun down in the machine, a centrifuge type of a thing to separate the growth factors from the blood, which is then uh, put onto the wound. Uh, you may have heard of it um, used in sports industries, uh, orthopedic uh, problems, knees, elbows, even Achilles tendon, where it's injected into the area. It's used on, say, knee replacements where they inject the gel onto the uh, debrided uh, cut ends of the bone to stop it from uh, bleeding and to promote the healing. But this is also used uh, topically uh, on the diabetic uh, foot uh, ulcers as well. Uh, can be done in hospitals, surgical centers, uh, doctor's offices uh, with different companies that come in and take the blood out of the patient's arm and spin it down and apply it to the ulcer. The skin coverage we were talking about the before, uh, many, many different products out there, artificial products and uh, products from different uh, organisms and uh, species of animals and different parts of the bodies uh, from uh, infants, uh, etc., and human skin to uh, cover wounds. Uh, some of them are called off-label. I assume everyone knows what that means, uh, that it's not approved by the FDA for this specific indication that you want to use it for, but it is approved uh, in general uh, for other sp uh, indications, but you're using it for a different uh, application that the sales people are not promoting, but you're deciding to use it for yourself, and the patient uh, would have to be advised uh, about that. 
so many different products on the market uh, that could be used in this uh, situation. This would uh, be like your old-fashioned skin graft, where they take a skin from your thigh, for instance, and mesh it lots of times and cover the wound. Uh, split thickness skin grafts or full thickness skin graft. Those are always available and are options, uh, but there are lots of uh, other materials that are being used as well to avoid uh, donor site uh, problems, infections, pain, scarring, and as well as uh, under the skin coverage, a label would be a flap so if the patient needs a flap of some sort to move the skin from one section to the other uh, to cover uh, the wound. That can be done on the bottom of the foot or any part of the foot as a matter of fact, to move the skin around to cover the wound uh, more natural. Uh, as I say, on the horizon would be this uh, FDG PET. Uh, you may know PET scans uh, from uh, cancer uh, diagnosis, uh, but that's being used as well with added uh, chemicals injected into the body to uh, check for infection and uh, osteomyelitis, and that would go back to the uh, statement we said before about the bone scans and MRI. This would be another uh, modality that would be done in the radiologist's office uh, in the future. That's supposed to be one of the up-and-coming uh, tests that uh, you may hear about later on. So I guess, uh, Mr. Hyde, I think we'll open it up uh, to the questions, and if it's okay with you. Oh, definitely. We do have a bunch of questions in the queue, so we'll get to them right now. Uh, Dr. Obachemsky, Ron asks, do you have any thoughts about what effect a prolonged, undiagnosed, and untreated seminole infection could have on a diabetic on diabetic foot ulcers that appeared to be in good shape and hearing before the seminole infection, but that then took a decided turn for the worse? I think the word you said was hearing, but I think you mean the healing, I suppose. But that's, uh, that's uh, sure, point. yes. Okay. But uh, salmonella, I think, would be a rare uh, foot infection, first of all, uh, as far as I'm aware. Uh, you're hearing it in the, the general media with uh, food contaminations and things like that. Uh, but it doesn't make any difference uh, what organism would be. Uh, yes, uh, the longer the uh, organism is, is there, the longer the infection, then the uh, worse the prognosis. Uh, that's what I would say, yes. Okay, excellent. We have a question here from Brandon who asks, how do you treat CRPS? Uh, well, first thing is to diagnose it correctly. Make sure you get the diagnosis uh, quickly. Uh, the CRIPS, CRIPS 1 and 2, as I said, the old term, RSD. Uh, the podiatrist incumbent the podi upon the podiatrist to diagnose it very, very quickly. Uh, that's why I said it, it should be included in the differential diagnosis, because the longer you wait, that's uh, not uh, good either uh, as far as uh, treatment and uh, cure. Uh, one of the main uh, things that should be done is a referral to a pain specialist uh, lots of times it means epidural uh, blocks, uh, oral prednisone by mouth. The old uh, treatment was putting a patient in a cast and uh, putting the patient at rest, but now the newest idea is uh, physical therapy, movement of the part, and uh, getting the patient to a physical therapist, and if it's the ankle, foot, etc., cetera, uh, moving that part to uh, break up the problem of the uh, crypts. But uh, the doc usually the podiatrists wouldn't treat that problem on their own, and they would refer the patient to a pain uh, specialist. Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, Joanne asks, when would you consider a wound back application to the wound? Well, I just had a post-operative patient that was acute, and uh, it was a deep, so I put it on acutely in the post-operative situation, nothing to do with diabetes. It was a dehiscence of a plantar wound. That's one uh, option. But if we're talking a chronic wounds, a diabetic wounds, uh, that one day statement about the 50% uh, healing in four weeks, that would be one reason, that would be one time to make your change there if you're not getting any change. Uh, depth of the wound, uh, is uh, that's one reason to put it on. This uh, foam that, uh, it's literally like a sponge, like from your kitchen sink, but it's a, a black uh, color, and it's cut, and it can be molded and pushed into the wound. So that's one reason to put it on. Uh, but it basically, would go by uh, size and shape of the wound, the bigger wounds, uh, if, you, if you have exposed tendons, for instance, I one had a case, uh, where, uh, a burn on the top of the foot, all the tendons exposed. If you wanted to get that uh, wound bed uh, to look better, to granulate, uh, to then put a skin graft over it, that's one reason to use the back. Uh, and it depends on the patient's insurance as well and coverage, if they can afford this type of a thing, uh, with the visiting nurses and the machinery involved and the dressings and the foam and the bandaging. 
that's a, a practical point, as I was alluding to in the beginning, uh, rather than academic exercise. And uh, but uh, depends on the uh, type of wound that you have, uh, how long it's been there. I think if it's been if it's going on too long, you definitely have to change your treatment plan and go with something else. Uh, if it's a superficial small wound that shouldn't uh, need it at all, you usually need some depth uh, to the wound so that this uh, uh, foam would go into that depth of the wound. And it's a bit of an inconvenience, too, because you have a, a tube that comes off the wound up their leg to their uh, belt with this uh, mobile unit or to a tabletop a unit, so the patient has to be compliant uh, with that and accepting of that as well. Okay, great. Thank you. We have a question here from Greg who asks, what special precautions, if any, are required for a known diabetic undergoing surgery under anesthesia for protection against development of diabetic ulcers? Well, I would say then uh, you're talking about postoperatively, avoiding a postoperative uh, ulcer in a diabetic. Uh, so the type of anesthesia wouldn't make any difference. And I assume you're going to be talking about, in my case, I guess, would be a, a, a foot surgery a wound. But uh, if it's any uh, surgical problem, uh, say they have a hip replacement and they have diabetes, a uh, real big complication is a decubiti of the heel. Uh, that's a real big uh, common problem, uh, leading to severe complications in some cases. And uh, starting out in the hospital, immediately post-operative, uh, you have uh, turning the patient, the type of mattress they're on, the mattress pads, uh, the old uh, treatment of uh, sheep uh, wool uh, heel pads are not uh, supposed to be of any value. Uh, the newest uh, foam, big foam uh, boots that would go on, some of the holes that you can see through into the foot uh, to observe the foot, uh, keeping their feet, their, their ankle, uh, the heel off the bed with the pillows underneath their uh, calf, so simple things like that. And the nursing uh, service and the, the patient and the family observing making sure that that heel is not getting all red. That's the first the stage of a uh, wound, uh, diabetic, uh, any wound ulcer is that redness, and then progressing to that black, thick uh, scab, and then uh, Lord knows what would be underneath that, if that would have to be divided or not. But most of the time, lots of times, we'll just leave that alone and let it heal uh, by itself. But uh, say if it's a podiatric uh, surgery and you want to prevent uh, diabetic ulcers would be uh, the, wound, the dressing that you have on, uh, if you're doing a forefoot surgery, for instance, don't just have the uh, forefoot. Uh, you can dress the foot dressing on the whole foot to prevent abrasions, uh, pressure on the ankle or the heel, for instance, in the surgical shoe or the cast. Obviously, we have a cast on to uh, pad all the bony prominences uh, very, very well to avoid the pressure, uh, either with a removal or the non-removal cast. And then the uh, another thought is that if you're treating the right side, Make sure you protect that left side, especially if you have a neuropathy, because they could break down the left foot, the contralateral, uh, contralateral limb, because uh, they're putting too much pressure on that side, trying to take the pressure off of the surgical side. So you have to be observant there to make sure there's no uh, undue pressure points on that side. I hope that answers the question. Excellent. Thank you. So a question here from Adam who asks, does a prior toe amputation in a diabetic patient with known PVD, change the doctor's approach to treating a small ulcer? Uh, sure, I, I, I would think so, sure. The doctor, uh, that would be very important uh, thing to know that the doctor should know. Hopefully the prior toe amputation was not due to trauma, uh, which, uh, which would not be due to uh, peripheral vascular disease, but if the amputation was due to gangrene, ulcer, infection, uh, peripheral vascular disease, and that would be a red flag that the doctor should be uh, noting and examining and ruling out uh, further progression of this peripheral vascular disease. Uh, is, is the patient being treated for it? Is a follow-up with uh, vascular people? Is he on uh, blood thinners, uh, for instance, uh, for the uh, peripheral vascular disease? And I think you have to be uh, extra vigilant and uh, diligent to prevent uh, a recurrence of uh, uh, another amputation in another spot. Uh, or further proximal amputation, uh, mid-tarsal, et cetera, going up the foot. And there are a number of studies out uh, talking about that when a person has uh, one amputation uh, of a part of the foot, what's their percentage of getting another amputation uh, further up uh, the line up the foot or even 
uh, another amputation on the other side, on the other, on the other side of the body, and also uh, increasing their uh, mortality. Uh, once they've had a amputation at all, uh, different uh, reports uh, giving different statistics uh, on their increased in mortality rate just because of that uh, fact that they had an amputation. And uh, the approach also, uh, you're talking about treating a small ulcer, you, you can treat that small ulcer in any way that you want to, and just uh, keeping an eye on it to stop it from progressing to a, a large ulcer, uh, which could happen more frequently, more quickly with uh, the peripheral vascular disease. Okay, we have a couple more questions, and then we'll move on. Um, okay. Ron asked, following up on the uh, salmonella question, that was the first uh, question that we asked. Um, uh -huh. He, 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 he uh, submitted a question to kind of clarify and ask a new question. I'm referring to a salmonella infection affecting the gastrointestinal tract. Okay. I guess the issue is whether untreated salmonella infection could compromise the overall immune system and result to adverse reactions in the foot. I wouldn't say that, that sure. I assume if the patient is uh, pretty sick with that salmonella infection in the GI tract, uh, then uh, they'd be hospitalized and uh, they could be monitored uh, for the uh, foot problems as well. I'm sorry, I thought maybe you meant that there might be a salmonella uh, contamination of the foot because we do get all kinds of crazy uh, bacteria that show up in the foot wounds uh, from the GI tract as well. But uh, oh, wow. sure, I... I think you could have a, comp a compromised immune system uh, from the salmonella uh, overall uh, effect, just like I was talking about the sepsis and an infection and the cellulitis uh, causing sepsis and therefore an overwhelming systemic uh, effect. So a, a compromised immune system, a septic patient from salmonella certainly would not help any uh, diabetic uh, foot problem, uh, be it infection or ulcer. Okay, and the final question during this Q&A break comes from Daniel who asks, are surgical maggots still used to promote healing while stimulating blood flow? Uh, yes, the maggots are used. You can order them. The doctor can order them in a private office if they want to. Uh, wound care clinics and hospitals uh, could use them. I don't believe they promote any blood flow. I believe they're just the use for debridement. Uh, that's all. Uh, the the uh, larva put on the wound, and they just uh, eat away all the dead and necrotic tissue. And uh, if the patient and the doctor and the nurses can stomach the whole situation, <laughs> then they could be used, uh, but they, then they are used. They are still used, and uh, they're advertised as well. The companies are advertising in journals that you can order the uh, maggots. Yep. Okay, excellent. Why don't we move on to the uh, diabetic packs? Okay. I just uh, thought there were some pertinent uh, facts that I recently saw, for instance, uh, from a journal called Podiatry Today from a Dr. Houston, uh, as far as... Um, how many patients the patient is going to see and how many cases the attorneys might uh, see where 8.3% of the population has the diabetes, 18.8 uh, million people diagnosed, and lots of undiagnosed uh, diabetics as well, uh, just like a uh, silent killer of high blood pressure, lots of uh, pre-diabetics, lots of people come in the office saying they're pre-diabetic, they're an early diabetic, I have a little bit of diabetes, just like I'm a little bit pregnant, and uh, so the doctor has to be aware of that. Uh, to uh, check and see. Sometimes the diatrist is the first one to, di to diagnose diabetes because they come in with uh, all the signs of a diabetic foot the problem, infection or neuropathy or ulcer, and they have, the patient has no idea they have diabetes. And we send them out for the test that we were talking about before, uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, glucose, and the, di the uh, diabetes is diagnosed. And there you see in 2007 how many deaths from diabetes and the complications from a diabetic uh, foot ulcer. Uh, it's not a small problem, resulting in uh, lots of uh, hospitalizations. Uh, the diabetic foot ulcer being the most of the complication of the diabetes. And the uh, statistic from 2006 with the amputations, number of amputations, uh, the recurrence of a foot ulcer. Uh, we have a number of the amputations. Uh, put another way, uh, per 1,000 patients uh, from 2008, and you have the source there for that uh, statistic. And uh, another uh, source is saying that the amputations per year now up to 86,000 from 2006, uh, where we had 65.7. And uh, going back to that other statement we talked about before, when you have one amputation uh, and your percentage of having another uh, amputation, that 
would there be some statistics for that. And mortality uh, rate also after amputation. Uh, some of these things are discussed in the handout that I had mentioned before through the diabetes uh, foot ulcer as far as mortality and bilateral uh, problems uh, with the uh, ulcerations. I think that uh, does about all the uh, statistics and facts that I had uh, concerning the diabetic uh, foot. Did you have any other questions, Mr. Hyde? Uh, we do. We have a couple more in the queue uh, for you. We have uh, a follow-up question here from Daniel who asked, uh, hold on, sorry, from Adam who asked, um, as far as treatment goes, if an antibiotic is being prescribed, would a culture be required? No, not necessarily. Not all the time, no. Uh, one reason you don't need a culture is if you don't have any exudate, first of all. And if it's a simple-looking uh, uh, wound, you don't have to have the uh, culture. I think it's a frequent uh, question that comes up in uh, testimony and depositions. Uh, is that culture required? And I don't believe it would be standard of care that it would have to have a, a culture and sensitivity for every uh, problem, every wound, every ulcer that comes into the office uh, every time you prescribe an antibiotic. Uh, no, I don't think it has to be. It certainly would be uh, good practice, and uh, it certainly would help uh, for documentation. And I think uh, the further along you go in the treatment and the deeper, the more complex uh, problem, then definitely the culture. And we talked about the type of culture to take as well, uh, deep uh, cultures, for instance, and biopsies. And I only think it helps uh, the doctor to do all these things. But uh, And we also talked about changing your treatment uh, plan uh, at some point if things are not getting better. And that would include, if you haven't done the culture ready, to... Uh, do that cultural sensitivity. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, James asks, do you have any statistics or have you read any statistics uh, for the failure to diagnose DM or the misdiagnosis of it? Uh, no, I couldn't help you with that, no. Uh, either uh, diagnosing from the family doctor or a specialist or the podiatrist, uh, no, I couldn't give any statistics on uh, how many times diabetes is not diagnosed, no. I couldn't help you with that, sorry. Okay. Uh, going back to the antibiotic question, uh, what's the most frequently prescribed antibiotic to treat the problems with the foot? I think uh, specifically for foot uh, problems, the cellulitis or uh, ulcers, you'd have to look to the cephalosporin that class, and that would be Keflex, uh, cephalexin, I think would be your most uh, common, uh, 500 milligrams uh, twice a day or four times a day. Uh, Augmentin is another big uh, choice. Uh, that is used, 875 milligrams. Uh, some doctors using uh, Cipro and Leviquin, but uh, I think a lot of people are getting away from that because of the uh, possibility of tendon ruptures, Achilles tendon ruptures, for instance. Uh, Leviquin is nice and easy to give once a day, but uh, I think the risk of the tendon rupture is uh, too high. I saw three cases, I'd say, in the last uh, year myself of uh, acute inflamed Achilles tendons from either one of those two drugs. Uh, that's what I was talking about before. You know, sometimes you'll get a, a doctor giving a Z-Pak uh, that they use for sinusitis, and they would uh, sometimes feel that that would be uh, used for the diabetic uh, foot wound. And sometimes it is indicated, depending on your culture and sensitivity, as we spoke before, but I don't think that would be uh, the first line of the drug. And it depends on the patient's allergy history as well and other medical problems, and that's why we go back to the review of systems and the uh, past medical history to see if they have a comprom uh, compromised kidney function, for instance, renal function, and their allergy history. But I would uh, say that uh, your uh, first uh, choice usually that you're going to find in the records is going to be a cephalosporin, in my opinion. Okay, great. Thank you. We have a question here from Charles who asks, should the propensity for shortcut issues affect the initial treatment for an injury diagnosed as an ankle sprain in a known diabetic patient. What was that first word you said? Sorry. Should the propensity oh. for sharp cut issues affect the initial treatment for an injury diagnosed as an ankle sprain in a known diabetic patient? Uh, no, I don't think uh, you would be thinking of Charcot uh, foot problems. Uh, I think that would be low on your list in your differential diagnosis. Uh, again, going back to the SOAP note in that S uh, for uh, duration, etiology, trauma history, you have a 
a good history there of an ankle sprain, trauma history, you have a date, a location, whether or not it's recurrent, uh, treatment, uh, and that would be usually a black and blue swelling, pain, localized, the painful motion uh, from trauma, unless, of course, it's this diabetic neuropathy that we're talking about. You may not have the pain, but you're going to, certainly going to have that history, and you're going to hopefully going to have some black and blue with an ankle sprain if it's an acute situation. And you're not going to have a black and blue with a Charcot. And as I said, your Charcot is more towards your gout than your infection. Uh, it does have swelling, but it's usually redness, a heat, redness, uh, inflammation, and uh, you wouldn't see those things with a uh, acute uh, injury, trauma, ankle sprain. Okay, great. Um, what's the most frequent complication that you see with diabetic foot ulcers? Well, first would be a non-healing. That would be the first the complication. Uh, then uh, the infection, uh, when they would, if they become infected, uh, then osteomyelitis, uh, would be the uh, complication uh, of a diabetic uh, foot wound uh, necessitating uh, surgery or continued treatment and hopefully a non-amputation as far as a extreme complication of a diabetic uh, foot wound. Okay, excellent. And in, in your uh, work as an expert uh, reviewing soap notes on cases, uh, where do you see um, where either uh, the, the biggest liability is or on the defense side um, what they should look for in a soap note uh, when they're working on these case, types of cases? Well, I think that's the whole premise of the whole discussion is to look at this whole uh, chart, uh, not just one note, but this whole chart which uh, hopefully encompasses uh, all of these uh, uh, thoughts and items that we said in this whole uh, soap note. Uh, and any one of these areas can be a uh, problematic area uh, for uh, the defense to uh, say why the doctor didn't do some of these things or for the plaintiff to say the doctor didn't do this and this and didn't document uh, this or that as far as uh, treatment. Uh, I would say probably the treatment, what treatment was done. The doctor might say in the uh, T, the treatment, just say, you know, uh, uh, debrided uh, and redressed. And that would be it. And week after week after week, uh, that would be probably a common uh, problem that uh, would be seen. So I think that's where the documentation would need to be uh, beefed up uh, most of the time. Okay, and our final question, uh, where is the most frequent location for a diabetic foot ulcer? I would have to say the plantar forefoot uh, underneath the metatarsal heads, uh, one through five, anywhere along that area. Then the dorsal toes. Uh, from hammer toes hitting the uh, top or the outside of the shoe. Uh, I think that would be, I feel that would be the most uh, prevalent uh, areas. Uh, we talked about uh, decubiti and the heels would be uh, coming next. Uh, if the person had the venous cystasis uh, along with the diabetic uh, wound, then you'd see it more on the ankle, uh, lower leg. But I'd say the top uh, area would be plantar uh, forefoot below the metatarsal heads. Okay, excellent. I think uh, that's all the questions that we have. Uh, Dr. Vashansky, do you have any concluding remarks that you would like to make? No, I think I tried to cover everything as best I could. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, hope it was informative uh, for everyone. I'm happy to uh, have participated and I thank you very much. Okay, well, excellent. Thank you so much for the time and the effort that you uh, put into the presentation. You're uh, welcome. And thank you to all the attendees that took time out of uh, your busy schedule to spend an hour with us this afternoon. I agree. If you'd Appreciate like to speak with Dr. Bacensky about a case or project that you're working on, you can contact us here at CASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319. As I mentioned during the introduction, we will be sending out the link to the archive recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. The archive recording will also be posted in the Knowledge Center found on TASA's website. To get to the Knowledge Center, visit TASANet.com and click on the Knowledge Center tab found at the top of the page. Our next webinar for legal professionals, Statistical Tools for Attorneys in Litigation Part 2, will take place on May 8, 2012 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You should have received an invitation from me uh, for that webinar, and if you did not, it will be included in the follow-up email that goes out tomorrow morning.
If you have any follow-up questions or comments, we do take all your comments under consideration and they help us to produce better programs. Please send me an email at amhide at pastanet.com. And like I said, we'll take those comments under consideration and it will help to uh, help us to produce better programs. Uh, with that being said, I will now end this afternoon's program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.